this is now the last video of the course. I may make another one just with a few closing remarks, but it's the last one with mathematical content. And uh, to round things off, I want to give two amazing applications of the Frankel Wilson theorem. Um, and the first one, they're both geometrical uh, applications. And um, the first one is going to be about, uh, it's actually sort of like a, the opposite of something we've done before. Is it going to address the following question? Um, let uh, V1 up to Vm, uh, sorry, that's not what I want to say. Let A be a subset or be a, a set of unit vectors in Rn. Uh, and am I going to ask it to be a measurable set? Uh, and suppose that um, it doesn't contain a pair of orthogonal vectors. So if X and Y belong to A, that implies that uh, the inner product of X and Y is not zero. So earlier we talked about um, finite sets where we put a restriction on the inner products, um, but it was typically a restriction saying that they it, it can't be bigger than such and such an amount. Now all we're saying is that it just can't be equal to zero. Uh, so obviously we can have infinitely many sets with that property. We just take a small ball around some point. But so, so now we're not talking about the size, the cardinality of A, but the measure of A. So how large can the measure of A be? If you're uncomfortable with measure theory, uh, you don't have to worry about that too much. Uh, so what in particular do I mean by the measure? So A is a subset of the unit sphere because it consists of unit vectors. Um, so the unit sphere comes with a natural measure on it called Haar measure. Uh, well, maybe I'll, I don't know whether it's strictly speaking called Haar measure, but there's a, 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 it's a, there's a unique rotation invariant probability measure on the sphere. Um, so Basically, we're asking how large can, how large a proportion of the sphere can be contained in the set A. And all you really need to know is that something like that exists and that it's rotation invariant in order to make sense of the question. Um, and that it's all sort of defined for nice sets like closed sets, for example. Um, and what we're going to find is that uh, the measure can be at most I mean, it's, it can be, it can only be exponentially small. Um, there's a pretty natural candidate for the best possible set you can take. And that is, here's your sphere. It's to take a cap that's just a little bit, uh, it's got an angle here that's um, just a tiny bit less than 90 degrees, so it's not quite wide enough to contain two orthogonal vectors. And then you can afford to stick in as well the, um, I think I'm right in saying, put in the cap a little bit below, because this angle is a bit bigger than 90 degrees and this one's a bit smaller than 90 degrees. So if they're in different things, then that the angle will be bigger than um, a right angle. And if, if they're in the same half, then it'll be smaller. But uh, these caps are exponentially smaller than the whole sphere. If it does that, not, that, if you haven't seen that, that may not seem completely obvious. But um, the fact that these caps are exponentially smaller, you can sort of see it by thinking that uh, if you draw a kind of cone going up like this, um, then, well, maybe another one way of saying it is that here I've got a sphere of dimension n minus one, and this is a sphere of dimension n minus one with substantially smaller radius, and you have to multiply. The scale, so if the scaling factor of the radius is alpha, then the, the measure of this sphere here is um, alpha to the n minus one times the sphere down here. So it just gives you an idea. And this cap here is made out of, in other words, extremely small uh, spheres, which is why the, uh, the measure of this set is really very, very much smaller than the measure of the whole sphere. 
That is, I think, conjectured to be the best possible example. Uh, I'm not going to prove that conjecture. That's still an open question. Um, but, uh, and uh, by the way, just for quite a lot of the material I'm talking about here, I recommend checking out uh, Gil Calai's blog. Um, I also noticed that, uh, oh, I suddenly realized after I'd done the last video that I forgot to mention the names of the people who proved the theorem that I talked about in the previous video, um, the one about the size of a set system where all the sets have size 2p and no intersection has size p. And that was Frankel and Wilson. So that's the Frankel-Wilson theorem. I entitled the video the Frankel-Wilson theorem. Uh, actually, what they proved is a bit more general than that. And in the example sheet, you can uh, see um, some more general results that follow by similar techniques, as I said in the previous video. Um, but uh, well, Gil Kelly will his name will pop up later on in this video. But he's for very very good reasons. He's interested in a lot of these sorts of questions. Now, uh, but uh, did I say that he's got a lovely blog called Combinatorics and More? And uh, if you look up, for example, the Frankel Wilson theorem, um, you can, you'll go down a sort of rabbit hole of fascinating posts about this sort of material. Now, um, the proof of this, let's just remind us what, remind ourselves what we proved in the previous video. It was that if A, oh, well, I'll start with C, uh, if N equals 4P, P is a prime, uh, A is a collection of sets of size uh, 2P equals N over 2, and A, B in A, implies um, A intersect B is not equal to P. Um, actually, we had not, uh, that's if, uh, and A not equal to B. Um, we proved that uh, the size of A is at most twice n choose zero plus, plus n choose p minus one. Now we can construct from that very easily a pretty large set of vectors um, that contain no two that are orthogonal to each other. And how do we do that? Um, what we'll do is um, Sorry, I'm just talking nonsense. We don't haven't got a construction here. What we can say is that we can um, make the following, we can find a large set of vectors such that we can't find inside that set a large orthogonal, a large subset with no orthogonal pairs. So let me just say what I want to say. So uh, an immediate corollary is that if I've got some set uh, x that lives inside minus one, one to the n, um, and suppose it's a set such that uh, every x in x has exactly uh, n over two ones, and therefore n over two minus ones, and x, y in x, x not equal to y, uh, implies that uh, the inner product of x and y is not uh, not zero. Um, then the size of x is also less than or equal to two n choose zero plus plus n choose p minus one. So let's see why that follows. It's, in fact, it's equivalent. It's because uh, um, given some element x in x, let uh, ax be the set of i such that xi equals 1, then uh, ax has size 2p by hypothesis, because it's got n over 2 ones. 
but we also get that uh, x, y equals zero if and only if the size of ax intersect a, y equals p. Because then we get, um, so we have a set of size 2p, another set of size 2p, they live in a set of size 4p, uh, and then we get that um, x, y will be sort of one in this set of size p, minus one here, minus one here, and one. And we've got uh, p ones, another p ones, another p minus ones, another p minus ones, all that up to zero. And that's if and only if, because if I made the, um, the intersection a little bit bigger, then we'd have more ones than uh, minus ones. And if I made it smaller, we'd have more minus ones than ones. So um, we know that. Uh, so if we're assuming that maybe it's more instructive to say x and y does not equal to zero is not equal to zero if uh, ax intersect ay is not equal to p and the size of a so the size of these sets that we can get is at most this bound here and therefore the size of x is at most this bound here and now we're just going to do a kind of katana style I don't know whether that's fair to call it that, but anyway, a, a, an averaging argument very similar to the argument that we saw of Katana when we did the um, erdos corredo theorem. So um, I'm going to... So these plus minus one vectors um, aren't unit vectors, but obviously, uh, going back to the question, we've got a set of unit vectors and no two are orthogonal. I don't really need them for unit vectors. They can all just have the same size. And so just to avoid the a nuisance of having to normalize, let's assume that uh, all the vectors have size. Uh, it'll be root n. If they're all plus minus one vectors, their norms will all be root n. Uh, so I want to use an averaging argument to show that the measure relative to the measure of the uh, of root n times the unit ball, or the unit sphere, of such a set can't be too large. So here we are back again. I've got a set. Um, what did I call it up there? I called it A. So this time I've got A, which is a subset of um, the set of vectors of norm root n. And uh, so and we know that X is a subset of A, and we get that, uh, sorry, X is a subset of, so I'll call that the set B. So X is a subset of B, I mean, and what we just proved is that, uh, it's equivalent to saying that X intersect, or it implies that X intersect A has size at most twice, N to zero plus, plus n choose p minus one. Um, but we also know that uh, the size of x equals n choose two p, because it was a set of all plus minus one um, wait. Sorry, I don't want to call. I, I'm I'm getting confused with my with my uh, um, name, so I shouldn't have called this X. I'll let Y be the set of plus minus one vectors with n over two ones. That's better. So Y is a subset of B, and Y intersect A has that size at most and y has size n choose 2p. So why is this all true? Y is certainly a subset of b because uh, vectors with, um, that are all plus or minus ones have norm root n. Uh, y intersect a is a set that doesn't contain any pair of orthogonal vectors and we've proved that any set inside x that doesn't contain a pair of orthogonal vectors has at most this size and that is the size of y. So the point is that um, the intersection of y with a is at most a very small proportion of y because this is pretty close to, uh, this is n to n over two, which is not that far off from two to the n, whereas this is exponentially smaller than two to the n. Right, so uh, 
what can we say now? So this is where the averaging argument comes in. So now let uh, rho be a random rotation. Then um, we also have that y intersect rho a is less than or equal to 2 n choose 0 plus up to n choose p minus 1. That's because if I just rotate a, it still won't contain any pair of orthogonal vectors. The rotation preserves angle. And so for exactly the same reason, I get the same bound on uh, y intersect rho a. And um, for each y, so that's true for all rho, for each y and y, the probability that uh, y belongs to rho a equals the measure of a, or the, the red, uh, so the measure, by the measure of a, I mean, uh, I take the probability measure on now on root n times the unit sphere. So it's basically a proportion of the unit sphere that belongs to a. So uh, you could think of it another way. A is keeping still and y is rotating because it's the same as the probability that rho to the minus one of y belongs to a. So basically it's just the density of a inside um, root n times the unit sphere, which is what I'm calling mu of a. Uh, so the expected size of y intersect rho a equals um, or is yeah, equals mu a times the size of y but that's less than or equal to because it's always at most this and the average is equal to this so we conclude that uh, the measure of a is less than or equal to this bound here. Divided by n choose 2p. And uh, I'm not going to go into a huge detail about precisely how exponentially small this is. But uh, let's just say that um, this thing here we know quite a lot about how to estimate it. Um, and this is roughly, uh, the reason it's exponentially small is that's exponentially smaller than two to the n. And this is sort of something along the lines of one over root n times uh, two to the n. Um, up to some constant, I'll put a little twiddle there. Okay, um, so now we've managed to prove that uh, if you've got a subset of a sphere that doesn't contain two orthogonal vectors, it's got exponentially small size. That root n thing that we get here is sort of doesn't really matter because uh, it's slightly dwarfed by whatever inaccuracies we have in the estimate for the size of the thing above. But if it actually turns out to be possible to um, avoid that root n by a slightly cleverer argument, and that's on the example sheet. Um, but I want to move on and discuss the second application, which is a very famous application to a problem called Borsuk's conjecture. So I said a number of ideas from earlier in the course were going to make an appearance and uh, perhaps unexpectedly Borsuk comes back. Um, and we'll, we'll see why in just a moment, uh, because it's not just that it was the same person who made the conjecture, but there's actually a connection with the borsuk ulam theorem. And his conjecture was, uh, let uh, x be a subset of r to the n be some bounded set then x can be covered i contained in the union of um, n plus one sets of diameter smaller than the diameter of x. So 
So let's see why this is a reasonable bound by considering the case where X is a sphere. So let's, let's So in particular, I want to see why N wouldn't do. Uh, well, <clears throat> let's make a, a little observation. Um, if our set are uh, Y1 up to YN, um, then uh, the diameter of uh, the closure of yi is the same as the diameter of yi. So we might as well assume that they're closed. If we can cover with the, the sets themselves, we can cover with the closures. But then um, uh, the boundary of x is contained in the union of n closed sets. And then by borsuk Ulan in one of the versions that we talked about, uh, one of the sets. So of course, here I'm just assuming that x is a subset of the union here. So one of the yi's contains a pair of antipodal points. And of course that implies um, that it's got diameter equal to the diameter of X. And that is not allowed. So we can't do it with N sets, but um, I've left it as an example sheet, I mean, uh, as a question on the example sheet to prove that if you've got n plus one sets, then you can cover the sphere. And actually, <clears throat> this conjecture came to seem even more reasonable because it was, another observation is that uh, the diameter of the convex hull of a set is the same as the diameter of the set. So we might as well assume that x is convex. And indeed, that all the yi's are convex as well. Uh, so it's basically a question about convex sets. And if x is smooth, I won't say exactly what that means, but it roughly speaking means that it's sort of, you don't have any nasty corners. That one's smooth and that one's not smooth. So sort of polytope wouldn't, wouldn't be smooth, but if you've got sort of rounded off corners that's smooth, then the result is true. Right, so what are we going to do? Um, we're going to prove the general case of Borsuk. Actually, I just told a lie. We're not going to prove the general case of Borsuk. We're going to give um, an absolutely, uh, we're going to give a, an example that completely smashes the conjecture and shows that it's not just false, but wildly false. And this conjecture, or this uh, counter example, was due to uh, Jeff Kahn, and I told you he was coming back, and Gil Kalai. So when I say it sort of knocks the conjecture out of the park, they don't just give an example where n plus one sets aren't enough. They give an example where something like e to the root n sets, so sort of exponentially large in the square root of n, is not enough, are not enough. Uh, so the conjecture is not just false, but it's absolutely sort of ludicrously false. And um, the proof is ludicrously simple, or at least it is now that we've got the tools for it. So. Um, say false by miles. How are we going to do this? Um, let's take uh, our set to be the set Y. So first of all, let's start, I beg your pardon, start by taking set y from earlier. We don't actually have to do it exactly like this. Um, 
i.e., what was it? It was plus minus one vectors in Rn, where n was equal to 4p, with uh, n over 2 ones, and therefore n over 2 minus ones. Now, that's not going to be the set we take um, for Borsuk, but now we're going to do something nice to it. Now, let uh, Z equal the set of Y tensor Y such that Y belongs to Y. And what do I mean by Y tensor Y? I mean as an N by N matrix and the IJ entry is YI, YJ. So it's a rank one matrix. I don't really care about the fact that it's a matrix. It's just, um, but, uh, it is, and it's a rank one matrix. So uh, Z lives in R to the N squared because there are N squared possible indices here. So it's a matrix which we think of as an element of R to the N squared. Um, now, what can we say about uh, the diameter of Z and things like that? So, if um, x and y belong to Rn, let's have a look at what the inner product of x tensor x with y tensor y is. Well, it's sum over all i and j of xi xj, that's the ij entry of uh, x tensor x with yi yj, which is simply um, sum over i x i y i times sum over j x j y j. In other words, it's just the inner product of x y squared. Um, and so therefore the distance between, oh, well, first of all, let's just notice that uh, that implies that um, that equals the size of x squared. So um, if X is in Y, then uh, X tends to X, slightly wish I'd normalized now, but never mind. It equals N because the size of X was root N. Um, and we get that the distance between x tensor x and y tensor y, let's square it, equals therefore um, the size of this one squared plus the size of this one squared. So that's going to be n squared plus n squared minus um, the inner product of, or minus twice the inner product of x with y squared. So what we notice is um, this x inner product y squared is always um, greater than or equal to zero, obviously, because it's something squared. Uh, so this distance is maximized. at 2n squared, if and only if x and y are orthogonal. Um, and also follows uh, that uh, if we take any subset, now where what z was the set of all x tends to x, so if w is a subset of um, of z uh, has smaller diameter than um, the set of x, or let's call it y, the set of y in y such that 
y tensor y is in w uh, contains no orthogonal pair. So has size at most the bound we've had two times n choose zero plus plus n choose p minus one. Um, but uh, the size of z is n choose. 2p or n choose n over 2 and therefore the number of sets we need you can see we're done now the number of sets is basically one over what we had before is at least um, n over 2p divided by twice n choose 0 because each one contributes at most we have on the bottom and that's the thing that number of things we have to cover uh, and the main point is that is exponentially large n uh, and therefore in the square root of the dimension because this whole set, remember, lived in Rn squared. So it's an interesting question that uh, people think about, about what the, you know, now that we've uh, got a, a huge number of, uh, we've got a set that can't be covered by a small number, the number of sets needed to cover is absolutely huge. Um, people get greedy and they say, well, is this the right dependence, this uh, e to the root n? And that's still a not completely sorted out problem. Um, another thing is that if you work out the details carefully, you find that this proof doesn't actually give a counterexample unless the dimension is sort of something like what, 1500 or something, I can't remember exactly. I think it's now known uh, when the dimension is at least 65. And I think it's known that the conjecture is true when n is at most three or something. So there's a sort of range of values of n for which the conjecture is actually still open. Although I find that a, a less interesting problem, obviously, than um, the question of whether it's true in general. Um, but still, if one could prove it for dimension 12, that it was actually true in that case, that would be would raise a few eyebrows, I think. Um, I want to say something which I've been having had the urge to say many times during this course, which is when I present a proof that looks very, very short and simple, um, it's extremely important not to think that it really is short and simple. Um, this conjecture was open for many decades. It was, con I think it was formulated in 1933. It wasn't proved for 60 years uh, and people had thought about it. And uh, this method of proof just came as a huge surprise. And actually, I was a PhD student at the time, so it's 1993. Uh, no, wait a minute, that can't be true. Anyway, I was a, I was a just recently post PhD, and I was at a, at a conference in Cambridge, and Jeff Kahn was at the conference, and this result got announced, and it came like a sort of bombshell. And we all went to uh, his talk, and it only lasted about sort of 40 minutes to talk because he just finished the proof with nothing more to say. Um, and we were all sort of, and it was not just that it was a short proof, it was a short and completely understandable proof. Uh, so that was uh, one of those sort of nice mathematical memories from early in my career. Okay, well, thank you very much for following the course. Uh, one perhaps final um, administrative remark, which is that I think I've gone over my time very slightly. So this is, I'm into the sort of, strictly speaking, the 17th hour. However, I feel that, uh, with this method of giving courses by video, I've allowed myself a little bit more um, chat than I would have done in a lecture course in a, in a lecture room. And uh, so I think the amount of mathematical content is appropriate for a 16 lecture course. So I make no apology for that. Um, and I hope you've enjoyed the course.
And as I say, I may have one final sort of concluding video. I'm not quite sure about that yet. Um, and thank you very much indeed. And I've certainly enjoyed it actually. It's been a chance to reacquaint myself, or in some cases even acquaint myself for the first time with a number of absolutely gorgeous uh, proofs. And so I found it very, very pleasurable to, to give. Um, and for people following on YouTube, I don't really see why I should stop here. Um, so uh, I'm not quite sure how much I'm going to have time for in the near future, but uh, in the more looking slightly longer term, um, I think when I have ideas for other very, very nice proofs that can make good videos, I shall add them to my YouTube channel. And with that, I finish.